In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, Amen. <coughs> Just a few words. Today we will, on this post-reception of the Cassock trip, which is a tradition, a long-time tradition in the, in the old society by Pius X, Today we will see, hopefully, the bones of St. Francis Xavier Cabrini. And remember, she walked through the streets of New York City, as well as in Chicago and Seattle. And she went to Argentina. And she went, I think, to Brazil. So St. Francis Xavier Cabrini, she didn't have perfect health either. But it shows what a, a dynamite soul she had to really bring souls to the kingship of Christ. Yeah, it's okay. Steve. Get him a chair. So very briefly, uh, also we'll see the tomb today in St. Patrick's Cathedral. We'll see the tomb of uh, the great Archbishop Sheen and the greater Bishop John Hughes, who was called the Dagger. He was the one who um, told all the parish of New York City here that uh, it was during the time of 1800s when the Protestants were burning down churches. They had burnt down the church in St. Augustine's Church in Philadelphia. They had burnt down the church of the Ursuline Convent up in Boston. They were threatening to burn down churches in the New York Diocese. And remember, the New York Diocese at the time stretched all the way to western New York. So um, Bishop John Dagger Hughes, he was the one that said there's reports that the Pope has ships on the Mississippi and he's going to take over the United States. He says there's rumors to this effect. He said, well, he said, this is no secret at all. Christ told us, go preach to all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. So, of course, he said, we do want a Catholic president. We do want a Catholic legislature. We do want a Catholic Congress and Supreme Court. And we do want a Catholic military. This is no secret at all. So he said also, he concluded his sermon and said, if, if, if any Protestant touches one of my churches in my diocese, there will not be a Protestant church standing in my diocese. So the great father, uh, Bishop Hughes, we'll, we'll see his tomb today and pray at his tomb. Also, just a very great summary. You should have seen yesterday, you have a... a you have in the Metropolitan Art Museum, you have samples from all ages, from before Christ, after Christ. You have uh, samples of the pagan, I can't call them civilizations because they're not, but pagan cultures and the Catholic cultures. And you see samples of all, all these ages. And it's quite obvious to anyone who has an honest eye the pagan art and the pagan sculptures, which are not just art. For them, it was ritual. And I don't know if you saw it, but there was an altar from Mexico. The Aztecs who uh, sacrificed victims, they would lay the victims on the altar, rip open their belly and tear the heart out on top of the pyramids and offer it to the false satanic, to Satan, to the gods of the sun and the moon. That's when Our Lady of Guadalupe came in to put an end to that, to crush the head of the serpent that they worshipped. And there, there was also a few specimens, if you look, <coughs> they had a few, uh, they had a knife, one of the knives to uh, cut open the belly, and also 
an actual picture, a carving of a ceremony where they're ripping open the heart of a victim. They didn't, sh they didn't show too much. Down in Mexico City, they show a lot more. You see the skulls, the actual long knives they used to rip open the belly. But one thing that stood out with these pagan carvings and art and ritualistic is obviously the glorification of the flesh, but also the darkness, the satanic darkness, the sadness, the sense of despair, and enslavement of the mind to darkness. And you can see with the incarnation, with our Lord Jesus, with God becoming man, and our Lord Jesus Christ, and the the extolling of the Virgin Mary, how even in the arts there is reflected that, that light, <coughs> excuse me, that light of our Lord Jesus Christ. I am the light of the world. Who walks not with me walks in darkness, our Lord said. So that light that Christ chose, he chose to take the Greek and Roman civilization. And you saw a lot of the nudity, of course, but it's not a lustful nudity. I'm not defending the nudity, but I'm just saying it's not a lustful, twisted, pornographic nudity, as is being as it was in the pagan cultures, and as well dominant today. But what the Greek and Roman ideal was, well, what the Greeks called it arete in Greek, which was the education of a of the citizens to have virtue and to also no music and no poetry and be able to defend the truth in a philosophical debate. That was called the, the great education of the Greeks and the Romans. And they had to be athletic, and if they weren't, they had to have some training in it. Sports and music was part of their training. And Plato in his Republic, he talks about the importance of music and education and the importance of sports. Sports so they don't, the boys don't get too soft, and music so they don't become just brute animals. And the whole education was to form the virtuous man. So you see that engraved in stone, you know, the, the statues of the Greek and Roman era, they're not twisted like the rock musicians. They're not all emaciated and, and dressed punkish like the modern idols. But there, there is a sense of peace and virtue in those statues and in the carvings. Of course, it's pagan. It's, it doesn't have the, the glorification of chastity and virginity that Christ was and noble. And uh, doesn't have the grace, obviously, and the light of Christ. But it's important to recognize this fact that God chose to be born in the civilization prepared by him which was the Greek and Roman civilization. And he would take the best of that and baptize it and use it to spread the faith throughout the whole world. That's an important thing. God, God did not choose to be born in Mexico. He was not born in Indonesia or New Guinea or the Philippines or Australia. He was born right in the cradle of civilization, the Greek and Roman height of peace. And Christ himself said it, when I come, I will draw all things to myself. And on the cross, there were three languages, Latin, the Roman Empire, the Roman sense of law, civilization, and order, and hierarchy. Uh, on the cross was also uh, the Greek language. He, he chose the best of the Greek philosophy, of which St. Thomas Aquinas almost verbatim quotes Aristotle without any corrections. He just baptizes Aristotle and also Plato and even uh, some of the other ones, Socrates. So, and then of course, on the, on the cross, the Christ assumed the best also, even of the barbaric Germanic tribes. So when I be lifted up, Christ said, I will draw all things to myself. So he did. He fulfilled all the Old Testament of the Israelites. He chose the best of the Greek and Roman era. And, uh, of course, his own Jews, the ceremonies that pointed to him. And Christ did. And the, the apostles would go out. And then 300 years later would be the conversion of 
the greatest world power, the Roman Empire. Nobody dreamed of that during the persecution. And when Rome became Catholic, then the, the, the faith spread, spread. Not without, of course, the bombardments of heresies and attacks against the church always. But it's important to see that. And of course, you saw in the Catholic art of the high Middle Ages, you see the faith, you see the light, you see the beauty, you see the virtue, you see the extolling of Jesus Christ the King. And it's all Christocentric. And the churches and the architecture points to God. Everything is built with the sacrifice of a mass. And you saw also, I don't know if you saw it, but there was a, a, man, a book of scriptures that was written and illuminated during the Carolingian period. And that was the great Carolingian revival of the Catholic faith with Alcuin of York and numerous monks that he enlisted to help unify the kingdom in the Catholic faith. And that's the true renaissance, that's the true revival of any country is to come to Christ the King. And, and then, of course, in the modern art, the modern art is not only twisted and back to paganism and lustful, but has fallen worse than any pagan before Christ because we had the redemption. We had the light of the faith. Jesus Christ the King did come to earth. He did establish his church. He did claim kingship over all hearts and minds. So our age is, is more guilty than any other age before us. And Christ talks about Tyre and Sidon. Woe to Tyre and Sidon. It will be worse for them on the day of judgment in Chorazon because they refused Jesus Christ during his lifetime. What about our modern age that had the Catholic faith and has turned its back to our Lord? So this is all very important for all of us to see how thirsty we need Jesus Christ the King. And for any country, for any revival, for any restoration, it has to come through the Virgin Mary and our Lord Jesus Christ. There's no other solution. There's no other remedy. There's no other compromise with democracy and modern errors, modern errors of liberalism and Zionism and communism, socialism, modernism, etc. We have to reject all the works of darkness and build again on the rock, which is Christ. Anything else is sand. So let me just close with a true story uh, told to us in the monastery when I was there by Father John of the Cross, who died in 2002, a very holy death. And he was in the monastery in France before Dom, Dom Gerard went with the modernists. And uh, he had a guest speaker come in. It was a survivor of the Gulag. And this survivor told the monks that um, there had been a couple, there was a couple that traveled throughout the world. The father, the husband was Calvinist, and the mother was a Puritan. So the worst of all Protestant combinations. But this couple, they, they traveled the world to see just which civilizations were the best. They traveled to um, the African civilizations, and they saw, this was in the mid-1900s, so they saw the, uh, the influence of the church there through the missionaries and the nuns, the schools, orphanages, and um, the, the virtuous life that they were promoting. But they also saw the pagan life, the old cannibalism, the many husbands and wives, uh, polygamy. They saw the arts. They saw the. They, they traveled all over the world, visiting pagan cultures, Catholic cultures, Protestant cultures, and they spent their life doing this. And eventually, they converted to the Catholic faith. And their conclusion was when they saw China, Japan, and the Asians. They saw the pagan cultures were. There was a darkness there, a sadness there, and a the the the, the 
role of the women was lowered. Not feminists, but they were, they were more seen as objects rather than human beings. And when they came to the Catholic cultures, the Catholic countries, they saw strong marriage bonds, large families, beautiful architecture, especially the churches and monasteries and facilities. They saw the arts full of life, full of Christ, full of the extolling of the Virgin Mary. They saw all the models of the saints that the church holds up to all of us. And through the beauty of the Catholic faith, through her arts, through her architecture, through her music, they said this has to be the true faith. Because everything else is ugly, everything else is dark, everything else is depressing. So they finally embraced the Catholic faith. And that was the story of their great conversion, just through the effects of the holy faith that we proclaim and that you, future priests, God willing, will preach to this world, will bring the light of Christ to this dark, dark age of apostasy. And we are due for a huge punishment, as we know. And some of you young ones, if you make to the priesthood, you may live to see, perhaps, perhaps God knows, you may live to see the time of the Antichrist. And you will have to be very strong and be ready for martyrdom. So, so let's turn to the light of the whole world, the light of heaven and earth. Jesus Christ, the King, who comes down on this altar, is asking to inflame our cold, hardened hearts with a great love for him, like his blessed mother. <clears throat> o Mary, conceived without sin. O Mary, conceived without sin. O Mary, conceived without sin. Oh, <laughs> 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 